Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on innovative partnerships in child support and reentry. My name is Ronine Davis, and I am a grantee technical assistance manager at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Before we begin, I have a couple of technical notes. If you encounter connection or audio problems during the webinar, please call WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3239. We'll also post that number to the chat box on your screen. Unfortunately, there are some connection issues we may not be able to resolve during the webinar. However, we are recording today's webinar and it will be posted along with a copy of the slides used in today's presentation on our website at nationalreentryresourcecenter.org. At the end of today's webinar, we will have time for questions from the audience. To ask a question, please enter it in the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. You can ask questions at any point during the webinar, and we will do our best to answer as many as possible before we end today. There will also be a survey sent out after the webinar, and I encourage you to fill that out and specify any topics you would like to see addressed in future learning opportunities. So joining me for today's webinar are Rose Bynum from the Federal Office of Child Support Enforcement, which is part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and she's a program specialist in Region 3, which covers Delaware, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, and the District of Columbia. Also joining us today are Deidre Bailey, Family Engagement Specialist at Virginia's Division of Child Support Enforcement, Brian Hawkins, the Family Engagement Coordinator at the Virginia Beach Department of Social Services, and Carmen Dean, Program Specialist at the South Dakota Division of Child Support. To get started, I want to give a quick overview of the Justice Center. The Justice Center is a national nonprofit organization that serves policymakers at the local, state, and federal levels from all branches of government. Staff provides practical, nonpartisan advice and evidence-based, consensus-driven strategies to increase public safety and strengthen communities. You can find our website at csgjusticecenter.org and can follow us on Twitter at CSGJC and on Facebook at CSG Justice Center. In addition to serving policymakers, the Justice Center provides technical assistance to all Second Chance Act grantees through the National Reentry Resource Center, or NRRC, which is funded through the Department of Justice's Bureau of Justice Assistance. The NRRC was authorized by the passage of the Second Chance Act and was launched in 2009. We are constantly adding new content and resources to our website, and we send out a monthly newsletter that provides information about the latest research, funding opportunities, distance learning events, and other news about reentry. We encourage everyone who hasn't done so already to sign up for the newsletter by going to csgjusticecenter.org forward slash subscribe. The newsletter highlights second chance grantees, provides information on new publications and resources, as well as updates re recipients on trainings, relevant news, and the latest funding opportunities. So under the Justice Center's Correction and Reentry Division, I oversee the Community Initiatives Portfolio, which provides technical assistance to all Second Chance Act grant programs that are awarded to nonprofit, community, and faith-based organizations. Second Chance Act grants have been awarded to a variety of government and nonprofit agencies to run different types of reentry programming. Many of those programs choose to include family-focused programming in their work. Of all the different types of grants that have come from the Second Chance Act legislation, five have required family supportive services to be included in their programming. These grants have included family-based treatment, mentoring for incarcerated parents 24 years old and younger, mentoring for adult parents, and supporting children and families of, children and families of parents who are incarcerated in federal prisons. In our efforts to provide more support and resources geared toward family supportive services, we developed a webinar series focused on fatherhood and reentry that included partnerships with the National Fatherhood Initiative, the Fatherhood Research and Practice Network, and various Second Chance Act grantees around the country. Our website also features various resources to help build or enhance programs to ensure they are taking families into account when supporting those returning from incarceration. For today's webinar, though, we are focused on issues pertaining to child support. When discussing child support and incarceration, there are two primary categories, those who are incarcerated for failure to pay and those who have existing child support orders um, who are incarcerated on other charges. 
Today, we're going to be focusing on the latter. To learn more about policies in your state pertaining to both of these categories, I encourage you to visit the National Council of State Legislatures website at ncsl.org and the Federal Child Support Office's website. And we're going to have a list of resources at the end of the presentation that you'll be able to access as well once we post the, pre the presentation on our website. So child support has been one of many barriers incarcerated parents face when returning to their communities. In our technical assistance work, we have come across programs where a parent was unaware of an active child support order or was unwilling to disclose that they had an order out of fear that it could affect their sentence or their ability to earn money once released. Another challenge for incarcerated parents is the accumulation of debt because they are unable to pay child support while incarcerated. To modify a child support order, most jurisdictions require a material and substantial change in circumstances. Unfortunately, as of 2016, there are around 14 states that treated incarcera incarceration as voluntary unemployment because the reasons that led to their incarceration were considered a voluntary act. These policies may be changing soon with new rules from the Federal Office of Child Support Enforcement, which we'll hear more about later in the presentation. While there are many states that will allow for modifications and in some cases suspension of child support orders due to incarceration, they often require the parent to be proactive. This means there is an expectation that an incarcerated parent has enough of an understanding of how child support works to know who to reach out to and what to ask to begin the modification process. There has been some progress in addressing these challenges. Most recently, California has passed legislation that requires the suspension of a child support order to occur automatically when a parent is incarcerated or involuntarily institutionalized. In Minnesota, they have instituted a child support liaison program that allows newly incarcerated non-custodial parents to speak with a child support enforcement representative upon intake into the prison. While there are a number of policy and legislative changes that, that can take place to improve an incarcerated parent's ability to support their child while making a living wage and successfully returning to their community, the most important thing for service, for service providers is to develop partnerships. Whether you work for a child support agency or a social service agency, it's important to bring together child support professionals and programs that provide parenting workshops, assist with employment and education, programs that build financial literacy, and those programs that provide connection to benefits, among other important services. On the, slide, on the side of this slide, you'll see I've pulled some headlines from past child support newsletters, a monthly report issued by the Federal Office mm -hmm. of Child Support. It's a great resource that I encourage you to sign up for. As you can see, the report highlights examples of the partnerships I just described and underscores the transition of child support from being seen as just collectors to supporting family-centered services. At this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Rose Bynum from the Federal Office of Child Support Enforcement to tell you a little bit more about the office and what's happening on the federal level. As a reminder, we encourage you to submit questions in the Q&A box on the bottom right-hand corner of the WebEx screen at any point during the webinar, and we'll be able to get to those at the end of the, at the, end of the webinar. Thanks. Good afternoon, and thank you, Roni. I appreciate this opportunity to explain a little bit more about what's going on in the Federal Office of Child Support Enforcement. Next slide, please. The Office of Child Support Enforcement has a mission statement as do most organizations, and our mission statement indicates that we partner with federal, state, tribal, and local government, as well as other agencies, to promote parental responsibility so that children receive support from both parents, even when they live in separate households. A couple things to remember is, though, that OCSC does not provide direct services to families, so families cannot come into a federal office of child support enforcement and seek to establish or enforce or in seek to change, uh, modify their um, support orders. They must do that through their local child support office in their state or tribe. Either parent may apply for services, and we would hope that it would be the custodial parent that has the child to apply for support and then the non-custodial parent, if they've exhibited some, if they've experienced some changes in their income, as Ronine spoke to before, as well as grandparents or caretaker relatives, other custodians may also apply for support if they find themselves in a situation where they have custody of a minor child. 
Next slide, please. The core services that child support offices supply are to locate parents, establish paternity, establish and enforce support orders, and that means paternity is already established or a non-issue, modify orders when appropriate, collect and pay child support payments. What OCSC does is to ensure that child support agencies develop, manage, and operate their programs effectively and according to federal law. States also have their own laws that they have implemented to help them with processing their own cases that do not conflict with federal law, but may aid them in the processing and procedures of how they implement child support services. States have the various tools which they use to locate non-custodial parents, or sometimes in some events, custodial parents. It also have, we also have the Federal Parent Locator Service, which is available through our child support portal for the states. So if they're unable to locate someone using their own resources, they may access the child support portal to be able to locate the custodial or non-custodial parent. Next slide, please. We have shared goals with the child support agency as well as with the community at large. Some of our goals are listed here. Public safety is one. We want clients to be safe when they make application for support as well as when they make application to modify support. We have a domestic violence policy that we have provided uh, guidance to the states on how to weed out uh, those cases, not to weed them out in, in that they don't they aren't able to supply to apply for support, but to just put notification on those cases in which there may be a risk. We don't want anyone to have any harm associated because they are applying for child support as well as they are applying to decrease, modify, or even even increase their child support. There's personal responsibility also that we believe both parents should take advantage of. And that's, they have a financial responsibility, there's a legal responsibility, psychological um, reality for their children, as well as consequences when becoming a parent. And child support has some guidance on those aspects as well, that we do some training to the states so that they can apply those principles when they are working with their clients. It's especially important for those minor children who are having children that they are also made aware of what it means to become a parent. Reconnection to community really impacts those non-custodial parents who have found themselves incarcerated, homeless, uh, just for a couple of examples. And we also have some policy on that. We also will have partner with agencies that will assist with connecting the incarcerated or the homeless with their local child support agency to be able to get back in standing with their children as well as some community resources. Sustains employment is very important, and child support works with the Department of Labor. We work with other uh, community services. We try and uh, we will assist a state that already has identified child um, employment services that they can work with. I'm going to take a sip of water. Okay. employment services that they can work with, because you want unemployed individuals, when they become employed, to find sustained employment that will take them through the long haul, not employment that they can do randomly or employment that doesn't last, not with a company that I'm going to employ you now, but we already know down the road that you're going to close. So say not with a JCPenney's that will be closing their stores 
but with a Sam's Club maybe that we know is establishing more businesses. So you want sustained employment, and you want to be able to reach them where they are. So child support partners with those types of employment services to find the unemployed employment. One of the important things that follows that then, because with the sustained employment, you can be assured of reliable child support payments. So if they have sustained employment, they're able to pay their child support payments. They're able to take their child out and have relationships with their child apart from just paying child support monies because they have sustainable employment that allows them to sustain their own livelihood as well as have some time for their children to have some fun time to take them out to um, assist them with schooling, those types of things. Now, when an incarcerated individual already has a debt when they go into a prison, we, how do they manage that debt? So that's an important thing when they come out. How do they manage it? So we also have programs there. We have a debt compromise program. Actually, we don't have it. The states have it. But what has happened, what we've seen through best practices of the states, when they come to us and they tell us, well, we have this issue here and we're not too sure. Arrears are so high. What do we do? Because we have communicated with the 50 states and, and the four jurisdictions, uh, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Guam, and, and the Samoa Islands, as well as other um, international now, we can put those programs together. That, that the, if we show that they have been sustainable. Not only have the programs been sustainable, but we can validate their information and they become our best practices. We will compile them and put them out on the web. We have a compromise, a debt compromise programs uh, throughout the states, and those are on our websites, and you can go and view those and see if they can be tailored for those who are states as well as States will work with other fatherhood agencies, for example, to work with them to establish some types of debt compromise programs. To that end, California has a very good debt compromise on the West Coast, and on the East Coast, Maryland has a debt compromise program. Next slide, please. Now, the flexibility, efficiency, and modernization in child support programs final rule is the first comprehensive revision of the child support regulation since welfare reform. Welfare reform, I don't know if everybody remembers or you may be new to child support. Welfare reform was in 1996 when President Clinton at that time signed the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act. What that did was it put different types of regulations into place. It changed the uh, program from being a welfare program uh, collection for welfare reimbursement to being a more family-friendly uh, and, and, and centered type of program, as well as it put in performance measures for the states to ensure that the communities, the, the uh, clients were being served effectively. If paternity is an issue, then that was one of the uh, performance measures that was put into place because you want children, as said earlier, that's one of our initiatives, is to make sure that paternity is established. And sorry, I just went down. I have to bring it back up. Okay. So as part of President's accountability and government initiative, executive branches were directed to identify and consider regulatory approaches that could improve program mm -hmm. flexibility for all programs, promote technological and program programmatic 
innovation, and update outweighted ways of doing business. So this rule that was signed into law and passed, well, it was signed by the Congress in December and then signed in um, January, it is all-encompassing, we tried to. We tried to encompass what we heard from the states. We tried to put in what we heard from advocacy groups, what we heard from parent groups, researchers. And there was a broad consensus in the field of some changes that we needed to make. So we were excited, and we still are excited, to see this new rule come into place. And it incorporates evidence-based practices and state innovative approaches, including strengthening procedural fairness for processes, streamlining program operations so that they can operate more efficiently, and then updating some technology requirements to keep up with the advances in uh, automated systems, such as the electric, electronic record records and filings. And that eliminates all the paper that people always have, not people, well, I do because I don't shred when I should. But that will eliminate paper, and it's technology in, in form now that mostly you, the same way you can go online and pay your bills, you can go online and do your filings. So this makes it a much more efficient system and much more efficient at record keeping because you only need to keep those items, those orders, whatever is mandatory, not only for federal requirements, but for state requirements as well. Next slide, please. Review and adjustment of child support orders is one of the changes that we made, and this is one of the changes that really impacts incarcerated parents. It requires both states to request a review and adjustment within 15 business days of learning that a non-custodial parent will be incarcerated. So if a state learns that a non-custodial parent is being incarcerated, and they can find that out by various ways, they may have sent a notice and it came back that the person is incarcerated and they can follow up on that. There are some automated interfaces and which will alert assert a state that a non-custodial parent is incarcerated. So if we learn that a non-custodial parent is incarcerated greater than 180 days, it authorizes the state to review and adjust the child support order without waiting for the request to come from the non-custodial parent. And the reason being on that is that research has found that very few incarcerated parents petition for a modification even though their order could be suspended during incarceration. Some states will allow for that. As a result, by the time that parent is released from the incarceration, that's when the significant debt is really impacted upon them. Because if you stayed for a year even, that's a year of arrears that has accumulated on your child support order. And we've learned that that might drive individuals to go underground and be involved in the underground economy instead of looking for employment. There is a situation in Maryland where the health department administrator had gone out and, and talked to some of the gentlemen that they had found jobs for because they had a job program, and they went underground as soon as that wage attachment hit because the income that they were making and the wage attachment did not leave them a sustainable, sustainable amount of income. And those NCPs did not realize that once they got out, they could have filed a petition for modification. Not saying that in every state that will be honored, but in that particular state, they had enough time accumulated in which they could have been modified. Uh, subject, um, subsequently, that particular state is now doing a program to try and see if they can jumpstart the um, modification process for those who are coming out, and they're helping them to find employment. So that's one, uh, one example. So in this 
Now, the state will provide notice to both parents, but they will all they will be able to go ahead through with their process. Also, what the final rule did is not exclude incarceration. As Ronin said, some states formally considered incarceration as a voluntary not unemployment. And this means that they cannot say incarceration, if you were incarcerated, you were incarcerated by your own will, and now we will not review and adjust the order. Next slide, please. Guidelines. Each state has their own child support guidelines. They can be based on the economic, uh, economic information of that state from the Labor Department, or they can be based on a formula. There are also formulas that uh, Melson formula is one to decide what should be child support based on the parent's income. So the guidelines now must provide that the child support order is based on the parent's income and other evidence of ability to pay. It will take into consideration all earnings and income of the non-custodial parent, but at the same time, it will take into consideration the basic subsistence needs of the non-custodial parent who has a limited ability to pay by incorporating low-income adjustments such as a self-support reserve or some other method. And Pennsylvania is one of the states that has a self-support reserve. And what that means is, say, your self-support reserve is set at $1,000. If the only income that you have is $900, then the way that they, the child support can't be based on where you used to make uh, $3,000. It has to be taken into consideration that that non-custodial parent needs that self-support reserve to live. If impute, imputation of income is authorized, it has to consider the specific circumstances of the non-custodial parent. And what that means is they also have to take into consideration the non-custodial parents' ability to earn uh, monies. So there was a time when states could impute income based on the fact, well, this is the minimum wage, this is what you should be making, and so we're going to impute an order based on that. But if, in, if it's authorized, then it has to be some basis to show why you're imputing guideline. It's at the state's discretion, but it'll have to be, once that case is looked at, that case has to show that there was some basis for them considering an imputation of guidelines. We say this because at one time, there could be a standard, states would select a standard amount to impute guidelines. So states could say, okay, if we don't have a verifiable source of income, we're just going to set orders at $50 a week for the child. So if the order is set at that amount, meanwhile, the person may not even be making enough money to pay that amount of child support. So now, imputation of income, although it's authorized, show us a, a basis upon how you arrived at that amount for child support. Next slide, please. And these are the specific circumstances. The non-custodial parent's asset, their residence. Do they live at home? Do they, do they uh, have their own uh, place that they're paying for, whether or not they show income? If they have an in employment and earnings history, if they have job skills, if they have literacy, if, if they are a doctor and now they do uh, lawn service, or what's their educational att attainment, their age, that has to be taken into consideration. 
health, the criminal record, and, and other employment barriers. States have discretion also to consider the custodial parent's income in specific circumstances. The guidelines will address, and they must address, how the parent will provide for the child's health care needs, and that's for both the custodial parent and the non-custodial parent through either private or public health care or through cash medical support. And cash medical support is that if there is no one has, if um, let's say the custodial parent does not have access to medical support, then the non-custodial parent, if they don't have access either, they can give some money towards medical support and hopefully the custodial parent will be able to then obtain medical support. And if you notice at the bottom, here we have must prohibit the treatment of incarceration as voluntary employment. That's different from review and adjustment because when we talked about review and adjustment, that is after an order is already entered. This is prior to the entrance of an order. So a guideline order would prohibit the treatment of incarceration as voluntary employment. So you have a application for support services made, the state finds out or the local child support agency finds out that the non-custodial parent is incarcerated, they do not have to enter an order of support at that time because there is no employment monies and there will not be until that person is released from custody. Also, three-fourths of the states have eliminated treatment of incarceration as voluntary employment in recent years. I'm sure you have seen the um, news lately in which we see various states coming uh, to their legislatures to make changes in their uh, law for voluntary unemployment. Thank you very much for your time. I will now be introducing Deidre Bailey and Brian Hawkins from the state of Virginia who are going to talk about the program in Virginia. Thank you. Services under the director of Daniel Stone decided that he wanted to create a program that focused on men and mainly fathers. So we started off by creating a program called Fathers in Training that was geared toward men whose children were somehow engaged or connected to our system, meaning social services. We created the and the and how it, let me tell you how it went. It went this way. Men would come into our program based on the fact that they may have had an abuse charge, or physical abuse, emotional abuse, or something that pertained to their families. Once they got there, they encountered, um, based on what they have said, difficulties being able to com communicate their feelings in a way that the agency could understand. Uh, many other fathers talked about making mistakes. And so the program expanded its, its view by looking at how to deal with anger management dealing with conflict resolution, having effective communication courses, and also parenting. And most of all, they talked about is lack of employment. This went on since 1996 until 2013. And this collaboration came about because Craig M. Bersham, the Division of Child Support Deputy Commissioner, Director, called the agency in to have a conversation around how we could serve our community better collectively. And so Clever Invent was birthed from that. And Clever Invent does all those things that we just talked about, but most of all it has an employment component that the Division of Child Support has brought to the table. 
And now not only are we sustaining these men in dealing with their issues in reference to child support, but also dealing with the issues of how to be good family men. On uh, many occasions when an individual does not have employment, he only he don't, just don't suffer with the fact that he has no money, but he also struggles with his self-esteem. This collaboration that came together was really led by Deidre Bailey, who is a enforcement person in child support enforcement. And this peer support, and when we talk about peer support, we mean that we create a group where individuals come together and have the ability to talk about things that they wouldn't ordinarily talk about to anyone else. So creating a safe place for them to be able to talk about these things helps them to grow from feeling like the world is total world is against me, these agencies are holding me down to the point where they can talk to the person to their left and to their right and say, you know what, maybe we can do this. The professional guidance is one of those type of guidances that is not overwhelming, but it's in the part of facilitating this dialogue so that they can get to a place to feel like they can manage this. And so when child support came on in 2013, it was really designed to help them to be able to hear things that they wouldn't ordinarily hear. They talked about the fact that when letters came to their home, they were so frightened that they would not open them up. And so now, for the first time, they're sitting in a group with somebody who can relay exactly what child support wants from you, what the stipulations are, and not only that, but support you in getting employment. So for many people in the city, that was a great paradigm shift for them. And in having that paradigm shift, it, I'm telling you, it's a process. So they're still, in the first three years, two years or so, they were still struggling with trying to figure out if it was what, it, what we said it was. And then eventually, many of them got to a place where they began to trust the fact that if I come to this program and child support see that I'm in this program and that I listen to a person who's delivering this information, and if I kind of follow that and trust that process just a little bit, maybe I can benefit, and not just me, but my family. Let me tell you the makeup. I'm going to tell you the makeup. I can. So first of all, I'm really excited to be here with Mr. Hawkins to tell you about Club Reinvent because we're really passionate about this program. Club Reinvent is a two-hour weekly class for men who have various pay and child support. Um, we've had as few as five participants in the class to as many as 43 in the class. The average person stays in the class anywhere between four to six months. And the first part of the class is about job readiness. And Mr. Hawkins and I, we teach about job readiness skills. And the second half of the class is the fatherhood peer support part, where Mr. Hawkins, he teaches that alone because it's all about men. So I think that a man should, a man should be that, do that approach. So again, um, it is a two-hour weekly session, and we talk about budget, we talk about educational opportunities, and there's always a teachable child support moment during the class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, practice, 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 because this is an employment piece for the class, and I always tell the men that practice doesn't make perfect, only perfect practice makes perfect. So every class, the men have to do some kind of exercise regarding completing applications. They have to do some kind of exercise regarding finding corrections or finding corrections on a resume. During every class, we have a mock interview. We will randomly call up two or three people, and the class will be the evaluators. And then we give feedback to that person. Sometimes Mr. Hawkins and I will the evaluator. And at times we'll bring in a third party just out of the box so that the men can have a neutral um, evaluation. But on every class, they are going to have something regarding dealing with applications. And we do this because we want the men to feel comfortable when they are out there looking for employment. And with our class, we're very fortunate to have a computer lab right next door to the class because most of our men, they do not have access to computers, nor do they have a smartphone. So we can go to the computer lab right next door, and this will allow the men to search and apply for jobs. It will allow them to check on their work-related emails because they are required to register with the Virginia Employment Commission. And once they register with them, um, they will get jobs sent to their email. But if they don't have a computer, they cannot check the email. So we have a computer lab right next door to us. 
and the men can apply for jobs and respond to jobs before or after class. Now, because we're always working on applications, we're always doing resumes, we're always on the computer looking for work, the men um, are required to go to job fairs. I find job fairs throughout the area, and I send the men out for them to mingle at the job fair. What I like about them going to the job fair is that they have to bring back some kind of trinket from that job fair. At every table, an employer has a pen, they have a squishy ball, they have a tablet, they have something that they are promoting about them, their employment. The men bring that back and they have to tell me or tell the class something about that employer. It can be as simple as the address for the employer or it can be as detailed as they like for it to be. I also go to the job fairs because I want to see how the men are dressed and how they're interacting with the job fair participants. The Wall of Fame. The Wall of Fame is putting a big smile on my yeah. face right about now. Um, the Wall yeah. of Fame is a bulletin board that Mr. Hawkins and I, we have, and it has names of everyone who's come through the program and they are employed. And when an individual is employed in the class, we celebrate them. And the name serves as encouragement because the men in the class can say, this person came through the class, they have the same barriers that I have, and they found employment. And we always tell them that, yes, having a felony on your record is hard to find employment, but it's not impossible. So when they see all the names on the board, they are encouraged to keep going and look for employment. Mm -hmm. Transportation assistance. Um, while the men are going to job fairs, while they're coming to the class every week, we provide them with bus tickets just so they can get around so there's no expense to them. It is free for them. And another thing, too, if they find employment while they're in the class, we will pay for their work clothes. We will also pay for tools. In regards to transportation assistance, if they find employment and they're in the program and their driver's license are suspended, we can reinstate their driver's license. If they have other things going on with their driver's license, we will show them how they can get a restrictive license or at least help them apply for a restrictive license. Mm -hmm. Okay, the teamwork makes the dream work. On many occasions, we have to model what we talk about, and so it was very important that we connected to people who were in the community who were pretty much looking for the same kind of results that we were looking for. What this does is give these men an opportunity to meet other people in the community who care about what they're doing. And so they were, we would also invite them to our program to be able to present, uh, to, have, to shake hands with these young men, uh, to tell them many of them lived close and in the area of some of these programs. But the most important thing is, is that when they walked out of there after talking to individuals from our community who were working to support them, they felt encouraged. Uh, on many occasions, they would come in feeling depressed. And again, having difficulties with that trust factor, is this really working? Is this really child support being involved in this process? But by the end of those sessions, after picking up all this information from these different programs, they left out much stronger. One of the main things that I think was really great, a take-home message was that they all had an opportunity to verbalize who they are, where they are, and what they're looking for. So on many occasions we talk about doing these mock interviews, but they got an opportunity to talk to people in the community each and every time they came into our group. Not only that, we opened our group up for people from the state level to come in. Ms. Bynum was one of those individuals that came in the group one day, and she got a real good feel for men who actually care about their families, care about getting work, and then some of their barriers. Child support does matter. Although the men are in this program, I let them know that you still have an obligation that you have to pay. I know that it may be hard if you have a two, $300 order and you do not have any money. So I always tell them that any payment is always better than no payment. What we're looking for is effort. You can take a little baby step until you can increase your payments to where it needs to be. Don't look at the big picture. Chop some off every day. During class, the third week of the month, the men are passed out an itemized pay history so they can see exactly their account. If they have not made a payment by the third week, they are strongly encouraged to make that payment. 
And because most of them have orders that they can't pay, during the initial assessment, they are giving a review and modification form so that we can look at their order so that we can right size it for their current situations for both parties. So child support does matter and we look for effort. If you can't make the full payment, do not let a month go by where you're not making anything, and we stress that on a regular basis. Now, fuel for the body and mind. What this is is we have speakers that come in quite regularly. Like Mr. Hawkins said, we invite people to come in. Um, so far this year, we had um, speakers to come in to talk to the men about restoration of rights. We have employers to come in to talk to the men about what they are actually looking for um, on the application. How much weight does the criminal question bear? Um, we have ex-offenders who come in and talk to the men and let them know their struggles and how they overcame those struggles. We, just, we had an attorney to come in and teach the men how to navigate the court website and fill out the forms themselves. But on this particular slide where it says fuel for the body and mind, we had a nutritionist from the SNAP program who came in and did a hands-on activity and cooking lesson about healthy eating for the men. After each speaker comes to the class, the very next class, the men are giving just a quiz, just to make sure that they did learn something, that there's a takeaway in the program, and they retain the information. So all of our speakers provide some sort of hands-on activity. Yes, safe zone. What this really stands for is really creating an opportunity for people to feel comfortable and safe in their environment. On many occasions, we don't know where these men come from. When we start to talk to them, we have to recognize that some people are dealing with mental health issues, substance abuse, and an incarceration history, and traumatic experiences. So when we start to peel these 10 layers that they have, we have to be very cautious as to how we're doing it because they're also sitting in a group full of men. And so what we hope to do is give them a voice. On many occasions, and they will talk about it, that they will come to certain agencies such as ours and feel that they have no voice. In order for us to be successful in helping them, we have to create a safe place where they're able to tell you things that they wouldn't ordinarily tell you, to admit to things that they wouldn't ordinarily admit to. And so this therapeutic piece of this says that when you come in here, you're safe. You're not worried about anybody knocking on your door or, or somebody coming to get you because you owe child support. You're sitting in a space where not only can you relax, but you can learn from in a different in different ways, meaning not only articulating and communicating, but also hands-on work, people coming in and talking to you about things. Uh, what we've heard after doing these kind of groups is that I feel better, um, I, I, I think I want to do something now, or I was very depressed and I didn't know what to do, I still have the inability to trust, I haven't been out long, so I'm not sure if they want me living there. All of these things impacts how a man lives his life. Um, so it's very important for us to recognize the fact that when you come to us, the first thing we're going to do is make sure that you understand that we're happy that you're here. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is we're going to ask you what can we do to help support you. And the third thing is to make sure that you have a voice. And so when you walk out of this room, you know you have somebody that you can call. The bottom line is, is that in these group processes, we're hoping to create a healthy environment for one another and sometimes keep healthy relationships for a lifetime. When you go through traumatic experiences, it doesn't take much to give you a, tra a traumatic reminder. And so many of these guys have been through a lot of stuff. And when you begin to hear what they've been through, it helps you to be a better service provider. And it helps you to be humble also. So the long-term impact is that we get an opportunity to share in the lives of individuals who never thought that we would be together. The other thing is that we get growth and education and knowledge from them because when they begin to talk, you begin to realize how intelligent and how much they know. And once they begin to lower their barriers and we begin to have this ability to put into them the kind of things that we're talking about, work, how to work, how to communicate effectively, how to deal with your anger, 
how to pull down things on the computer. You know, on many occasions we never think about the fact that they have difficulties working with the computer. And so when they're there with us, there's no shame in this game. And so it gives them that opportunity. And we also look at restoration of rights. When people are doing what they need to do, we want to make sure that we're in support of them. And don't get me wrong, because they do have challenges. Nobody's perfect, not even us. So they go through things, and once they go through those things, we want to make sure that we don't run away like many people have done in their lives. And so our program, I can say it again to you, is really designed to protect and nurture, but it's also a program that's geared to have lifetime rewards and connections. And, and this program also has put a more friendlier face to child support. And it has also helped with the increase of child support payments because now the men run to us rather than running from us. And what they do is they go out and they tell their buddies, you know, child support is not the same child support that's trying to beat you down, beat you down. That now they do see, because our motto is people helping people, and they do see that we want to help the entire family. So it has, it has been very positive to these men. You know, the process uh, with agencies working together that we, we both have our mandates, and we have to, figure, have to figure out a way to collaborate. And I didn't talk about it in the beginning, but what happened was is that the uh, Department of Social Services had a Virginia Department of Social Services Strengthening Families Initiative, Fatherhood Initiative grant. And so because we had a good standing in the community, we was able to connect to child support and help with that dialogue of his not your old child support. Now we have a more friendly child support who are looking to make sure that you first of all understand what they're asking of you. You know, when somebody is afraid to open letters, then, you know, that's a very traumatic experience. But now that that experience has turned into one where they can be hands-on with people in the city, where you go into to the, the jails and talk to the individuals, and not only that, you answer the phone when they call. Mm -hmm. It has changed the game for us. So I just wanted to make sure that I highlighted that this is a wonderful relationship, but it didn't get started that easy, but, it's, you know, it's worth it because now we're seeing the results. And at this time, we'll turn it over to Carmen Dean. Thanks, Deidre and Brian. This is actually Ronin again. We're going to um, turn it over to Carmen in just a moment. I just wanted to um, talk briefly about the program that in South Dakota that has partnered with the South Dakota Department of Social Services. Um, it's called Lutheran Social Services, and they were actually a 2014 Second Chance Act Young Fathers Reentry Program that I had the honor of working with. Um, their fatherhood program uh, had a lot of similar services as described by the Virginia program. Uh, the, one of the big differences is that they are a nonprofit, community-based organization that um, received this grant to implement those services. So that included parenting classes and case management pre-release, as well as case management, employment support, and other types of group workshops post-release. Um, so I do, I just want to give a little bit of a brief overview of that program, and then ask Carmen if she could tell us more about the partnership that Child Support and Lutheran Social Services developed together. So go ahead and turn it over to Carmen. Okay, thank you. Um, a little bit about the Division of Child Support in South Dakota. We're a rural, rural state, and our child support program is state administered with eight field offices, which are comprised of 91 FTE between the state office and the field offices. Of the 91 FTE, which is full-time employment, 54 are child support specialists who handle 40 case processing requirements for approximately 44,000 cases. Division of Child Support also handles approximately 13,000 non 40 cases. These are the cases where we're acting as a payment processing center only. South Dakota, in addition to these, South Dakota has eight reservations, and two of those, the Sisseton and Wapanaoti Tribe and Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, have a 40 child support program. Um, Division of Child Support also has a cooperative agreement with the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. In the spring of 2012, Lutheran Social Services contacted Division of Child Support regarding becoming a partner with assisting inmates transitioning transitioning into society. DCS saw this as an opportunity to become a part of a fatherhood service and enter in, entered into a memorandum of understanding or MOU with LSS. DSS met 
DCS met with the LSS staff and provided an overview of child support, in particularly the licensing restriction program and modification of child support orders. When a parent enters into the LSS program, a verification of participation form is completed. The form outlines the requirements of the program for the parent, and if they fail to comply with any of the requirements, they are no longer considered an active participant, and Division of Child Support will be notified. The form includes the participation, participant's begin date and pro projected end date. The form is signed by the parent and by an LSS staff member. A copy of the form is sent to DCS. When we receive this form, a notation is made in the case record and a copy is scanned to our electronic filing system for future reference. DCS notifies the LSS staff member of the child support specialist's name and contact information and the case number, which they provide to the parent. In some instances, LSS may also include an authorization for release of information which the parent has signed. This allows the LSS staff member to contact DCS with specific questions regarding the parent's case. This is beneficial in situations in which the parent is still incarcerated and is unable to contact DCS directly. With the MOU in place, DCS made exceptions to the re license restriction revocation process for those who, parents who are participating in the LSS program. When a parent owes $1,000 or more in child support arrears and the arrears are equal to or exceed three months of their current monthly child support obligation, a restriction is placed on their driver, professional, hunting and fishing licenses. The licenses are still valid. However, the individual is unable to renew the licenses until they either enter into a signed agreement with DCS, agreeing to pay their current monthly child support obligation plus an additional amount towards the arrears, or they pay the arrears in full. In order to enter into an agreement, the parent must also have a verified employer or at least three months of pay history. For those parents in the LSS program, DCS waived the three months of pay history and verified employer. If a parent enters into a signed agreement and does not comply, DCS has the authority to revoke the driver's license. However, if the parent is actively participating in the LSS program, DCS will not seek revocation as this would be a barrier for the parent to obtain employment. When a parent enters into the LSS program, they are active in the program for approximately six months. The parent has conditions which they must meet with LSS, and if they do not meet those conditions, will be notified. When this occurs, DCS pro proceeds with the same requirements for license restriction revocation as parents who are not participants of the LSS program. And I'll turn it back to Ronin. Thank you, Carmen. Um, I think it's really interesting. One thing we wanted to uh, achieve with this webinar was show how it works kind of differently, obviously differently, in different states with different types of populations. I think um, there could be a whole other webinar on working with tribal child support agencies and dealing with tribal child support, um, which is something that the, the folks in South Dakota have a lot of experience with. So there's a number of factors that, that play in here that are important. Um, so with that, we're going to um, go ahead and start taking questions. So we've been getting questions throughout the webinar, but just as a reminder, you can submit your questions through the Q&A box on the lower, um, lower right-hand corner of the screen. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. You know, quick question for Rose. Uh, someone had asked when the final rule that you were discussing was going to go into effect, and they were specifically interested in the portions about states notifying parents um, or automatically adjusting an order 180 days after incarceration. Uh, what happens with that is it depends on when each state filed uh, their guidelines. There will be a quadrennial, which is, is a four-year review. With some states, it can be as early as this year, whereas with some states, it may not be until the next year. It, it will probably, all states will probably be done by 2020, but it depends on what state you live in and when they last updated their guidelines. Great, thank you. Um, so then the next question that I have here is that many are hesitant or reluctant to contact child support as a resource. Uh, so this person was wondering if, um, 
there's, if you could talk about oh, any initiative or programs to help change the stigma of child support in the community. What, one thing I did want to throw out uh, before turning this over to one of our presenters is, I think this is actually one of the really great opportunities for programs like Lutheran Social Services and the Virginia Beach program where developing these partnerships where the first contact with child support isn't necessarily the child support office, right? It's, it's a service provider working with a father and talking to them about their partnership with child support and how it can be beneficial. Um, but I'll, I'll go ahead and start with Rose, but then I was also interested if Deirdre and Carmen, if you have anything else that you'd like to add about this as well, um, ways that to kind of break through some of that hesitation and reluctance to use child support as a resource. Well, you can use child support as a resource if they're afraid with contacting the local child support agency. They could contact the state agency that oversees the local child support program as well as they can contact each state and jurisdiction and tribe has a program specialist just as myself here. Uh, I have Pennsylvania and Virginia, but there are program specialists here that also cover Delaware and D.C., as well as Maryland and West Virginia. But you could contact the program specialist and see if they know of any programs within the state or within that local agency that they could talk to. Uh, but they could always uh, contact the federal office and we would direct them, they could contact me, I would direct them to their program specialist, the appropriate program specialist for their area that they could speak to about it. Because maybe they could be the ones to even get it started. Great, thank you. Um, Deirdre, do you have anything else to add to that as well? Um, either initiatives or programs that kind of help break down that stigma about child support? Oh, I think we might have had an audio issue there. Um, so we'll go ahead and move on um, to the next question here, actually. Okay, I'll avoid some of the Virginia questions right now while we work on the, the audio issues. Um, Rose, uh, qu another question regarding um, federal child support. Are there any brochures or marketing materials that are targeted to specifically to fathers that are returning from incarceration um, that inform them of their rights regarding modification? And I know this actually might be different state to state, but anything that you know about that's out there? Right now, uh, because the law has changed, it won't be necessarily as updated, but the changing a uh, support order guide we have on our website, and that would help them with the information for their particular state. It is, it's a general review, and then they can also access the state and look at their regulations, and they've put in there whether or not they will modified based on incarceration, what um, they will do, what services they have. And they also have some brochures in there as well that they could see. Okay, great, thank you. I'll um, get the, the website. Question. I'm sorry, oh, okay. I, I said I'll get the website and uh, give it to you so that they have. Okay, wonderful. And just so everyone knows, I'll, I'll advance the slide quickly just so everyone can see. We do have a list of resources here that includes a link to the Office of Child Support Enforcement's website. Um, but then, uh, obviously, if we'll, we'll uh, have the direct link. If people are interested, feel free to email and we can send that out. Um, but I'll put this back on our, on our email so we make sure everyone can get those because all of us can provide additional resources as needed. Um, the next question is actually for Carmen um, regarding the, the partnership that you set up with Lutheran Social Services. So um, the exemption that you made for fathers in the LSS program, the question is, was that, was that something, was that difficult to actually achieve or was that something that required any kind of uh, policy change? Um, it required a policy change on our for our division to make. Um, what we did is we just notified our staff um, when we get the authorization form or the, the or the verification of being a participant. There's a notice that goes to them when we create um, a narrative on the case. 
so they're aware of it so when that father contacts them and needs their license, they know to make those exceptions for them and just to send out the agreement for them to sign. So it was just a policy change for us for those. We didn't have to do any um, state law changes or anything like that. Great, thank you. Um, so we're, it looks like we might have Virginia back on the line because I do have some questions specifically to their program. So one question was about uh, where, where the participants are actually meeting. Are these participants meeting at the child support office or at the reentry office or if there's some other location? They're meeting at Virginia Beach Social Services. Um, I, I'd had a question, well, when the question came up of, about how we get participants, I wanted to make sure that we add the, add the fact that the participants of the programs are, the, are our best resource. When they begin to understand that this works for them, then they will tell the individuals in their community. We do community engagement. And we just kind of take the stigma off of child support now. Child support uh, has carried a stigma for quite some time, but now we're looking at what's most important for my child. So the individuals who go through this program, they get inspired about talking to other individuals about coming somewhere where they can actually get some help. Uh, so we do meet at child, we don't meet at child support, but we meet at a Virginia Beach Department of Human Services, and that also could be difficult at times, but somehow it's working for us. And I think it's because we've been working with fathers for almost 20 years at this point. Great, thank you. And, and yet there was that other, another question about where you get your, your participants, and so it sounds like part of that is, is word of mouth and your own outreach. Um, and another question was, are you go doing any sort of inreach into prisons or jails uh, to provide information on your program or specifically on child support issues prior to release? Um, yes, I do. I go to the local jail every other Thursday. Um, I speak to the men one Thursday, and two weeks after that, I'm speaking with the women. I also go to um, St. Bride's. I go to Indian Creek um, to do their resource fairs, and we do monthly visits to them as well. And I work very closely with probation and parole, and I am one of their team members for the Family Reunification Seminars. Great. Thank you. I think this also points to another uh, another reason we wanted to have this webinar is we see the difference in structures in two, di in two different states with their child support agencies. Um, I know in South Dakota, uh, the program staff at, at Lutheran Social Services provide some of that information that you were just describing, Deidre, in Virginia. It's this nonprofit staff who go in and provide that to the um, participants pre-release, and it's information that they were able to gather from their partnership with Carmen and, and her office. So um, different ways of approaching this, whether it's from the community-based um, organization's perspective, whether it's from the, the, the perspective of the Office of Child Support. Um, and there are, I know, of some programs that are actually run by prison staff or, or implemented by prison staff where they're actually providing that information. And definitely want to see more of those partnerships uh, pop up around the country. So the, the next question is for, uh, for Rose here. It says, did I correctly understand that we are required to notify both parents of their right to request a um, R&M within, within 15 days of learning the non-custodial parent is incarcerated and required to complete it within 180 days if we don't receive a response from either party. Um, I can read that again. Just let me know if you need me to, Rose. I'm sorry. What was that? Yes, yeah, so they were curious if, they're, if they are required to notify both parents of their right to request a R and M uh, within 15 days of learning the non-custodial parent is incarcerated, and okay. are they required to complete it within 180 days if they don't receive a response from from either party? Well, they don't they don't need to do it that way. What happens is once a state learns that the non-custodial parent will be in, uh, incarcerated for more than 180 days, they will then notify. Of the parents that there's a possibility to uh, for the review and adjustment. So we do it now every three years. So they notify both parents that they can request a, June, uh, a um, review and adjustment. Now they don't have to wait for the request that's to be made to, to initiate the review process. 
they can do it in advance of knowing that 180 days before what they had to do was wait until a parent said there's been a substantial, there's been a significant change of circumstances, or even sometimes parents just said there's been a change in my circumstance and I want to request a review for adjustment. And sometimes states have built into their guidelines, well, you can't do it unless it's been 25% uh, change in your income. But now what this means is once they've learned of a non-custodial parent's incarceration, they can right then start the process to notify the parents that they have the right for a review and adjustment of their case. That also, depending upon the state, the state may be able to do their own review and adjustment whether the parties respond or not. So say the custodial parent doesn't respond, but the non-custodial parent does respond or nobody responds, but the state has verified that they will be incarcerated for 180 days or more from the time that they get the um, advisement. So if it's 179 days, that won't count. Has to be 180 days. If they don't hear from either party, depending upon how they wrote their guidelines or whatever, uh, whatever other law they may have, they may be able to go ahead and do it because they have provided notification and have not received a response. If the custodial parent would respond, yes, I want to review an adjustment, then they could go ahead, whatever their process is on that. So I hope that's clear. Great, thank you. Um, we do have a question come up asking if there are, how to find programs, um, this person's from Texas, so how to find programs in Texas like there are in Virginia. Um, Rose, am I right in saying that uh, if people are interested in finding programs like this or collaborations like this in different parts of the country, that they could reach out to you or one of your colleagues uh, that represents that region um, to see who their resources are in that area? Yes. All right. So, like I said before, we have the emails up on the on the screen. So, I definitely encourage you to reach out. And if you go to the the OCSC website um, at the, the the federal office of the Department of Health and Human Services, they have all the regions listed out. Um, so, I definitely encourage you to check that out, check that out. Um, there was another question about um, whether there was an initiative aimed at assisting non-custodial parents with developing hard skills. Um, ideally getting them a job that where they could earn more than minimum wage. You know, one thing I, I will point out is the Department of Health and Human Services has a, what they call a Healthy Marriage and Responsible Fatherhood Program, and one of the three pillars of that program, of those grant programs, is work, um, economic stability. And so many of them do offer either hard skills or at least linkages to other employment programs that can provide training and, and support with finding jobs. So I encourage you to check out on the Department of Health and Human Services website, healthy, if you type in Healthy Marriage and Responsible Fatherhood, it'll take you to their grant program and they should have a list of the different agencies around the country that have received those grants. And they, um, that's one resource. I'll also point out that here at the Justice Center, we have um, a team that works on employment and reentry specifically, so it's not necessarily for non-custodial parents, but it does deal with um, people who are returning from incarceration and finding it, looking for employment. Um, so we can provide additional resources on programs out there that do that do that kind of work. So feel free to reach out to me or check out our website. Um, all right, the next question I had here, I think this might be another another Rose question. Um, it asks, could someone explain the difference again between whether incarceration is treated as voluntary unemployment for re review and adjustment versus creating a new child support order for someone incarcerated? Um, and they were wondering if this means um, if someone who's currently incarcerated who has order who has a current order, if they cannot have that order modified, but any inmate who does not have an order in place is protected. Um, so, uh, yeah, Rose, I think this question might be for you. So they're just asking again, the difference between whether incarceration is treated as voluntary employment for review and adjustment versus creating a new child support order for someone incarcerated. Okay, um, the guidelines have to be changed to allow the review and adjustment from the final rule to be taken into consideration. 
So I can't say that it's for every state right now. Some states already do take it into consideration, and some states still do not. And that's why this this is it it's, can't be a one size fits all right now. But some states have elected to not consider incarceration as voluntary um, unemployment. Right now, Virginia has an excellent program, but Virginia's guidelines have not been changed, and Virginia is one state that considers incarceration to be voluntary unemployment. So when their guidelines are changed, they will not be able to use incarceration as voluntary employment, unemployment. So the review and modification piece is if an inmate lives in a state, so say Pennsylvania, and an inmate lives in Pennsylvania and no one knows that the individual is incarcerated and say even though they have an interface, the reason they don't know that the individual is incarcerated is maybe the names are different. So they find out that the individual is incarcerated. Pennsylvania will now, because that's part of their guidelines, to, well, it's not part of their guidelines, it's part of a rule that they have. So they've enacted a rule where they can notify both parties that the non-custodial parent is incarcerated with no source of income, and if they do not receive an objection, they will go ahead and modify the support order because a non-custodial parent has no income. What the rules specifically will address once it is adopted by each state is that the state can go ahead and review and adjust the child support order. They have the option. They can select to re um, review and adjust the order within 15 days of knowing that the non-custodial parent is going to be incarcerated greater than 180 days. So even though Pennsylvania already has that rule, this will now be written into their guidelines. And then without waiting, they also have the right to not wait for a specific request. So they learn, they don't have to wait for the request, and then after they can do it, but then they would have to also provide notice to both parties. So I hope that answered it. And if not, they can give, they can contact me. Great, thank you so much, Rose. Um, our next question is for our club reinvent presenters in Virginia, Deirdre and Brian. Um, this uh, individual is asking if there was any data available regarding recidivism for the fathers that participated in the club reinvent program. Can you hear us? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, unfortunately, no, I do not have that data as to the recidivism rate for the men coming up, going in and back out of a cost of race. I don't have that data. It's not something that I can't create, though. I can go back and look, but I don't have it with me today. But it is something that is tracked by the program, it sounds like, right? Correct. Okay, awesome. So look, so I definitely encourage uh, people who are interested in seeing that, they can reach out. Um, uh, that is something that's looked at. And then um, another question that uh, really said was if these programs were offered to individuals on probation. I, I, I will say uh, before turning it over back to Club reInvent that in the Second Chance Act programs like Lutheran Social Services in South Dakota, um, many of those programs begin working with uh, parents while they're incarcerated and will continue to work with them after release while they are on probation or parole. Um, for folks that are not, that aren't incarcerated but are sentenced to a probation sentence, um, most Second Chance Act programs work primarily with folks who have a pre-release component of their sentence, an incarcerated portion of their sentence, uh, but there are some exceptions. Uh, Deidre and Brian, are you working with, uh, are there fathers involved in your program who are on probation? Absolutely. The program is offered to anyone with a child support case, anyone. Um, these individuals are court referral. Um, these individuals are self-referred. They can be referred by a community partner. They can be referred by a case manager. As long as they have a child support case and as long as they're looking to do better, as long as they cooperate, and as long as they want this in the program, it's offered to anyone. Great. Thank you. 
Um, the next question is uh, if we have any insight or opinion on promoting waiver of arrears as a way to help obligers coming out of prison. Um, so maybe we could kind of start with Deidre and then Carmen, if either of you have any insight on uh, promoting wa a waiver of arrears for folks that are coming out of prison. No, I don't have any insight regarding waiver of arrears. Now, I know that the state does offer a debt compromise, and of course that's for state um, funds, but nothing to, nothing to compromise um, the arrears. In South Dakota, we don't have anything that, as far as compromise, we do have like arrears forgiveness um, program, but if it's, if it's child support that's owed to the custodial parent, we cannot, um, it would have to be the custodial parent that would be saying, yes, I'll agree, and then it has to be approved by the court. That's pretty much the same, Virginia. All right, yeah, thank you. I think one thing that's interesting about um, arrears, I mean, like, like most of the child support rules and regulations, they vary so much by state. Um, but one thing uh, I learned recently was in Kansas, they worked out a program where um, Fathers who are who do have arrears who contribute a portion uh, and contribute some money to a college savings plan, one of the state college savings plans. Um, I, I don't remember the ratio exactly, but for every dollar put into the savings plan, a certain amount is removed from the arrears, um, and so they're expecting an increase of college savings plans at the end of the year. It's something that just started and was, a part, was developed in partnership with the Child Support Office, the Treasury um, Department of Kansas, um, as well as working with um, education, uh, Department of Education and educational partners. So again, just to the theme of this webinar of innovative partnerships, you know, it may not always involve um, the services directly, but working within your government structures to see where different uh, compromises and partnerships can help people address their debt while also having a benefit for the family and the children. Um, and I'm sorry, I thought I had mentioned this during the presentation, but maybe not. But we also on the website have a list of states that offer a debt compromise program. Uh, Maryland is one of them, and what they will do is they have a new program that I'm not going to speak to because you have to be in that program for that to be able to be the situation. But they offer to all non-custodial parents that have TANF debt that once they find employment within the first year, if they do not miss a child support payment, that they can reduce their TANF owed arrears by 50%. And if they stay employed, if they sustain that employment for two years, they can, um, all their TANF owed arrears can be wiped off the books. Okay, great. Thank you for, for providing that information. Um, we have another question um, regarding South Dakota. Um, this person was mentioning that they've uh, come across the U.S. Attorney's Office prosecuting several non-custodial parents. Um, causing another felony, uh, which makes it, you know, having that on your record makes it more problematic to secure a job. Um, and so, but some of those who are prosecuted were unable to pay because they were incarcerated. Um, I know with the program that, that you described, Carmen, that was a, a, a partnership that you would work out with Lutheran Social Services. Um, do you know of other efforts to support folks that do have felony, felonies on their records, might be struggling to find work, um, and are also have child support? Uh, payments owed, other efforts in the state to address their uh, needs or barriers? Um, at this point, I can't really say. I mean, we do, there is a federal statute that allows for federal prosecution, and it's kind of used as a last resort. The custodial parent has to agree, but now also under the final rule, um, there has to be an ability to pay when you refer somebody to court, which also applies to federal prosecution cases. So if they do not have the ability to pay, they are not going to be be able to be referred for those processes. So, um, you know, it's those that are already been through and went through the court, usually they're there until they meet, have paid what was due under the judgment of conviction. 
All right, great, thank you. I think um, you brought up a good point that I, I forgot about was um, that, that the fact that that final rule is making some of these changes. So I think even at the, even if you are uh, being prosecuted at the federal level, um, the, the new rules around child support and the, having the means to pay it are gonna be coming into effect. So I think um, that's one way to address it. Uh, but I do wanna also just encourage anyone who is working in this field, whether it's from the community-based organization side, child support side, correction side, whatever it might be, um, there are, uh, you know, re reaching out to your colleagues and other departments and other agencies, other service providers to help um, come up with these types of solutions similar to what Lutheran Social Services and Office of Child Support developed as well as what, the, what brought about Club reInvent, um, these are ways to help address some of these concerns. Um, we are coming up on the end of the webinar. I just want to, we have a few more minutes, so put out one last call if anyone does have any more questions, uh, to feel free to submit them in the, in the Q&A box. Um, while we wait to see if there were any other questions, I'm going to move to the next slide, which has some of the resources that we were talking about. Um, I want to just point out again the National Conference on State Legislatures. They have a project on child support in general, um, but they have a page specifically devoted to child support and incarceration. One thing that's really useful about it is it does have a link to a document that shows you the policies in each state. Um, so I know that we represented South Dakota and Virginia today, and Rose and I brought in some examples from other states, but for those of you uh, who have called in from different parts of the country that weren't uh, talked about on this webinar, I encourage you to go there. You can learn more about what your, your state's laws are around this, whether child support is managed from the legislative level versus the court level versus uh, department policy. Um, all of that information is on their website. Um, also with the caveat that some of these are, policies are gonna be changing now that the final rule has been released. Um, and uh, there are some links on this slide as well to give you more information about the final rule, the newsletter from the Office of Child Support Enforcement, and the Office of Child Support Enforcement's uh, general website. Okay, with that, we'll just go through one last check for any additional questions here. I don't think I'm seeing any. Um, if I did miss someone's question, I encourage you to reach out to us over email. Um, any of the presenters, we all provided our contact information, but I can also um, I can also follow up if you reach out to me and have a question for another presenter. I can make sure to get that answered for you. All right, so we'll go ahead and conclude the webinar. I just want to give a big thank you to Rose, Deidre, Brian, and Carmen for taking the time to present today and share information about their work. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us for today's webinar and submitted questions. I think we got a lot of great questions um, and a lot of great discussion from this, and I look forward to uh, future resources coming out as a result. Um, you, uh, at the, after this uh, webinar, you should receive an email with a link to a survey. I've also posted a link to that survey in the chat box a, a couple times, so um, I encourage you to uh, fill out that survey, take a moment to fill that out to help us to continue to improve the resources that we're providing for the field. Um, we will be posting a recording of this webinar with a PDF of the slides on our website in the coming weeks. You can find the National Reentry Resource Center's website at nationalreentryresourcecenter.org, pretty easy to remember. Um, so while there, I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter so you can find out about uh, more webinars like this, as well as funding opportunities and other resources for the reentry and behavioral health fields. But thank you all again for joining us, and have a great day. Thank you.